Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Joan Wages. I am president and CEO of the National Women's History Museum. Thank you. We welcome you here this evening. This is the fourth and final of our conversations that we will be having this academic year. So we are pleased that you can join us this evening for the topic of civil rights. Um, in uh, a, a, a quick update, the museum is having a lot of activity these days. We um, have legislation that is actually seems to be moving on Capitol Hill. We had uh, we uh, an opportunity to testify yesterday before the House Natural Resources Committee, and uh, they indicated that they would be moving forward on our legislation. And so we are very excited about that, and um, we're getting a good bit of media coverage. We had a New York Times editorial piece last weekend, and then a long New York Times uh, piece in today's paper. So um, we're thrilled to be getting some attention and um, getting some momentum behind our bill moving forward. Um, in particular, I would like to thank uh, several organizations. We have a coalition of um, women's organizations, and some of them have partnered with us for the program this evening. The AAUW, uh, Linda Holman, the executive director, um, have been longtime friends. All of these have been. Uh, League of Women Voters, Nancy Tate is here. Uh, National Alliance for Partnerships in Equity, uh, Lisa Ransom. Uh, National Conference of Puerto Rican Women, and its metro area chapter, that's uh, Carmen Delgado Vota, who is here, and um, Milagros McGuire, who is president of the metro area chapter. And then, of course, the National Congress of Black Women, uh, Dr. E. Faye Williams, who is one of our panelists this evening. Um, I would also like to acknowledge Dr. Jennifer James, who is an associate professor of English and director of the Africana Studies program here at the George Washington University for her programs. Uh, she provided financial assistance for the program this evening, so we appreciate that. Thank you. And so um, we uh, very much appreciate this opportunity to partner with George Washington University on this series of what, what started out as lectures, then it moved to forums, and now we've decided it should just be called conversations. So um, we um, are starting to plan next year's agenda, so we will look forward to seeing you in October when we um, uh, have start the new ac academic year. Um, our panelists this evening will are uh, Dr. Uh, Paula Gettings from Smith College, uh, Dr. E. Faye Williams from the Congress of Black Women, and our moderator will be Kelly Goff, who is um, uh, at the Daily Beast now. Um, so, but first I'm going to introduce to you Dr. Erin Chapman, who's an associate professor of history here at GW, and she is going to frame the conversation for us. So thank you again for coming. <laughs> Hi, and thank you for coming. Okay, so welcome to our panel, Standing Up for Change, Women and Civil Rights. Just a few remarks. African American women's history teaches us that black women have been essential to the long history of the black freedom movement. Because of this rich history, we know the stories of famous rebels and activists such as Mariah Stewart, Harriet Tubman, and Sojourner Truth. We document, we have documented the work of the founders of, of the black women's organizing tradition, such as Frances Ellen Watkins Harper and Mary Church Terrell. We revere the words of expressive artists like Phyllis Wheatley, Pauline Hopkins, Nella Larson, and Lorraine Hansberry. African American women's history teaches us to remember that women such as Rosa Parks and Ella Baker were not simply brave mother figures inspiring the movement from the sidelines, but savvy, skilled, radical organizers who crafted the grassroots foundation of the civil rights era. Through histories of such women, we remember that the civil rights phase of the larger black freedom movement depended on the work and sacrifices, networks and knowledge 
trust, and dedication of ordinary black women, maids, cooks, nannies, sharecroppers, hairdressers, teachers, to raise money, rally their communities, and populate the boycotts and the marches that won the movement its successes. So a little bit further, um, a little bit additional information about our panelists. Professor Paula Giddings was one of the first to help us understand the complex dynamics, not only of African American women's participation and presence in the, in the many stages of the black freedom movement, but also the racial and sexual politics that shaped the history of their roles. Along with a small cadre of black women scholars, Paula Giddings helped establish the field of African American women's history. The 1984 publication of her book, When and Where I Enter, The Impact of Black Women on Race and Sex in America, as one friend of mine put it, blew the doors off the field. Moving from the moment of emancipation in 1865 to the publication of the controversial Moynihan Report in 1965, this sweeping history documents the range of organizations, primary leaders, and gendered political debates through which black women, as both agents and symbols, helped to shape African American history and US society. Likewise, Professor Giddings' biography, Ida, A Sword Among Lions, Ida B. Wells and the Campaign Against Lynching, which came out in 2008, details the sexual and racial politics undergirding the American practice of lynching and the gender politics of the turn of the century phase of the black freedom movement that grew up around the effort to curtail this threat to black humanity. One of the great contributions of Paula Giddings' scholarship is its recovery of the history of the black women's organizing tradition. As the national chairperson of the National Congress of Black Women, Dr. E. Faye Williams is an heir of that tradition. The National Congress of Black Women continues to fight the good fight on behalf of black women and black communities. The NCBW engages a range of current racial and gender issues, such as the new disfranchisement of black and poor communities through the recent decimation of the Voting Rights Act, the severe curtailment of women's access to affordable and accessible outlets of health care and reproductive choice, which disproportionately affects impoverished women and women of color, and the new version of lynching shielded by stand your ground and make my day laws that are superficially race neutral, but serve as defenses for deadly attacks on black humanity and have not served as viable legal shields for black people defending themselves against racial and sexual violence. The NCBW seeks to foster black women's political participation, election to public offices, and appointment to presidential and federal posts. Dr. Ife Williams has worked as a teacher in the Los Angeles Public Schools, a professor of international law at Southern University Law Center, a minister, and an attorney. She has been a congressional candidate, is a radio talk show host and television commentator, and a peace and human rights activist. Kelly Goff, this evening's moderator, is an author, political commentator, and blogger through venues such as the Huffington Post, the Daily Beast, The Root, and the Washington Post. Kelly's political commentary has been published in Cosmopolitan Magazine, the Boston Globe, Politico, The Atlantic, and The New York Times, to name just a few. She has also appeared on both MSNBC and Fox News programs, so both sides of the debate. Kelly is the author of two books, 2009's Party Crashing, How the Hip Hop Generation Declared Political Independence, is an analysis of the complex and shifting political affiliations and beliefs of the two generations of African Americans who have come of age since the civil rights era. Her most recent book, The GQ Candidate, is a novel depicting the presidential bid of a black and Jewish man and its effect on his circle of friends and family. Ms. Goff's work engages the younger generation's perspectives on long-standing racial and sexual politics as they continue to shape the relationships between women and civil rights issues. With these three great panelists, we look forward to a wonderful conversation. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you so much, Professor Chapman, for that extraordinary introduction. I, I, for a second there, I was wondering if my mom wrote it. <laughs> and, um, but I have to say, I, I had already read up, of course, on the panelists here this evening, but, but hearing their accomplishments read out loud, it just reinforces what an honor it is to share the stage with them. And I really see it as my job to do exactly what you all came here tonight to do, which is to simply learn from them and their expertise and their extraordinary experiences. Um, so this is an honor to be here. Thank you so much to the Women's History Museum uh, for inviting me. 
uh, someone reminded me that I once said, I'm such a fan of the museum and its efforts that I said, whatever you need, anytime you need it, you pick up the phone <laughs> and call. They said, I'm going to start to regret it. I certainly don't tonight, but perhaps down the road. <laughs> but it's, it's a true honor to be here and I'm so excited for this discussion. I'm just gonna say really quickly a little bit of, about myself because I, I get this sometimes when I write about issues that have to do with history and people say, you know, what do you know? You, 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 know, you didn't go through what a lot of people of previous generations went through. What do you have to say <coughs> about the civil rights movement? And the short answer to that is, I didn't go through what my parents went through. I will never know what it's like to have gone to a segregated school, which is something both of my parents experienced. My mother was harassed regularly and called the N-word on a daily basis until the day she actually decided to deck the, the boy who was doing it, who had been <laughs> bullying her. And the extraordinary story that sort of, I think, tells people who say, you know, how can you go on TV and argue with these people or, or let these men say these mean things to you on air? And I say, because I'm, I'm my mother's daughter. She decked that bully, and when she went to the principal's office and they were talking to the white principal, and he says, she hit me, and my mother says, well, he's been calling me the N-word for the last week every day. <coughs> and uh, the principal says, is that true? And this is the South, and this is a, a white male principal. And the boy said, yes, it's true. I have been calling her that. And he said, okay, I can't stop you from doing that, but I'm also not gonna stop her from hitting you. <laughs> so that's the kind of mother I come from. That's one of the reasons I care about these issues because I will never forget that what my parents went through so I could sit on this stage right here today. And as a reminder of that, on my laptop, the screensaver I have is the Richard Avedon photo of Julian Bond, Diane Nash, and the other people of SNCC. And it's what I see every day I turn on my computer. And it reminds me that no matter how bad my day is, it's not nearly as bad as what they went through so I could have the right to sit at that laptop and write the columns I do today. So thank you for being here. Um, and I'd like to open it up to both of our experts if you have any opening remarks or thoughts on these topics. Yeah, thank you, Kelly. And uh, thank you, Dr. Chapman. And uh, uh, thank you to the National Women's History Museum and everyone. I'm very excited to be here. And um, I just can't, I just can't help myself. You know, my, um, when I was in third grade, I was called names. I grew up in Yonkers, New York. And my mother actually came to the school and gave the children a history lesson. Mm -hmm. She sat them all, made them all come in a circle and gave them a lesson on race relations in the third grade. I didn't have any more problems after that. <laughs> um, but my, my job today is, my, uh, for, the, for the panel, is to give you a little bit of historical context uh, for our uh, discussion. And um, uh, I uh, wanted to, so I thought about how I'm very short, because it's be a very short sort of opening salvo, hopefully, um, of, uh, the, the, to reflect the themes and the points of the, um, of, of the program. So what I decided to do was to think about one really major uh, historical event that has lots of connections uh, to the past and uh, to the present. And uh, it's not comprehensive. I'm just going to lightly touch on a couple of mm -hmm. things that someone interested may want to follow up with questions. <coughs> And, uh, and, and certainly uh, it's representative rather than, than comprehensive. So let me just uh, uh, talk about uh, a, a historical event that I always love to reimagine in my mind. And it takes place right here uh, in Washington, DC uh, in 1896. I'm gonna, re I'm gonna read it though, so I'll be succinct. Uh, the year <coughs> was 1896, the place, and the 19th uh, Street Baptist Church. Uh, where, which on a sweltering day in July was filled with African-American women activists who had come to create the first national black women's organization in the country's history, the National Association of Colored Women, NACW. Quote, it was a famous gathering of famous women, noted one of the attendees, Rosetta Douglas Sprague, an activist and daughter of the abolitionist and statement Frederick Douglass. Already famous was the NACW's first elected president, uh, Washington, D.C. resident Mary Church Terrell, whose life epitomized change. 17 years after her election, she was asked by the newly formed sorority at Howard University, Delta Sigma Theta, to lead them in the great women's suffrage parade down Pennsylvania Avenue in 1913 at a time when the mainstream white women's organizations were determined to exclude black women. Mm -hmm. 
The sorority was the second such organization that was founded. The first was Alpha Kappa Alpha, established in 1908. I know I have to do both. Mm -hmm. So that was in 1908. Didn't have and, to. Both, <laughs> and both <laughs> entities, as well as other organizations and sororities after them, took the NACW as their model, particularly its values around education. In fact, at a time when Booker T. Washington's industrial education in the trades had gained ascendancy, it was the desire and the de determination of black students to be scholars in the liberal arts tradition that was the motive for founding for the founding of the black Greek letter organizations, including those of the guys. Forty years later, after that parade, Terrell could be seen on picket lines with her cane and hearing aid. She was 90 years old at the time, in 1953, and a leader of a group of activists determined to desegregate Washington, D.C., and over the course of three years had marshaled national and indeed international support uh, for the monumental 53 uh, Thompson Supreme Court case that upheld previous anti-discrimination laws in the city and effectively desegregated Washington. During the course of that historic 1896 meeting, the women also paid tribute to those who had come before them, Phyllis Wheatley, Margaret Garner, <coughs> Sojourner Truth. But they were fortunate to have among them the great abolitionist Harriet Tubman, who was there at this meeting in 1896 and then in her 70s. Tubman had escaped from slavery in 1849 and led hundreds of others to do so most spectacularly as the only woman to lead a military campaign. In the spring of 1863, when Union troops were poised to sail their gunboats from Beaufort, uh, South Carolina, up the Cumby uh, River to torch some strategic plantations, Tubman had gotten intel from fugitive slaves about where the Confederates had placed explosives on the riverbanks. As a result, the gunboats, com the gunboats completed the raid unscathed, and Tubman led the escape of 750 South Carolina black men and women to freedom in that one raid. It's so fitting that in 1974, the Cumby Collective, another grounding black feminist organization, was named after that moment in history. Organized by Barbara Smith, among others, the collective pr provided a blueprint for espousing the need for self-love, the intersection of racism, classism, sexism, the role and recognition of lesbians of colors, who you can imagine how marginalized in the 1970s they were, who also analyzed predatory capitalism. We don't do that much of that anymore. <laughs> and who addressed historic exclusions uh, and racism in the predominantly white feminist movement of the 60s and 70s. Shirlene de Blasio, I love making all these connections. Shirlene mm -hmm. de Blasio, mayor, uh, the wife of the mayor of New York, I'm happy to inform you, is, was a member of that Cumby Collective. Uh, I just met her uh, at an award ceremony for Barbara Smith. Another attendee back in 1896 at that 96 <coughs> meeting was Ida B. Wells Barnett. Of course, I couldn't leave without talking about her, mm -hmm. uh, who came to Washington with her four-month-old child, Charles, to share in the historical moment of that great meeting in 1896. At the end of the meeting, Tubman came, uh, at the end of the meeting, Harriet Tubman came to the podium with little Charles, who was deemed the baby of the Federation, raised him over, over her head, and proclaimed him the baby of the Federation. Can you imagine that scene? It was Wells's, uh, Wells Barnett's anti-lynching campaign, especially after its triumph in the British Isles, that was a catalyst for the founding of the NACW, and the issue of racial violence and sexual exploitation subsequently became central to the activist uh, agenda of subsequent organizations such as the NAACP, which despite efforts to exclude her, that's another story you can ask about, she was a co-founder of. Both Wells Barnett's campaign and the NAACP called for a new abolitionist movement, referring to the coalition, the historic coalition of men and women, blacks and whites, who despite what the movie Lincoln seems to tell us really were responsible for the passage of the 13th Amendment, uh, that prohibited slavery, but which afterwards fell apart 
this coalition after the 14th and 15th Amendments, the latter of which enfranchised black men uh, and not women. Wells Barnett, who had the grit and determination subsequently seen in Fannie Lou Hamer, who, like Rosa Parks, was an anti-rape activist, we don't talk about Parks in those terms very much, who had the political vision of an Ella Baker, and who tried, as Shirley Chisholm did, to reconstitute an interracial and feminist movement alliance, brought all this to bear on Chicago politics, where she founded the first black women's suffrage club in the city, the Alpha Suffrage Club in 1913. In fact, it was the efforts of the Alpha Suffrage Club that was responsible for the election of Chicago's first black alderman in 1915, Oscar de Priest. By the 1920s, Chicago became a model of black women's political activism with the most and the biggest black women's suffrage organizations in the country. Wells Barnett herself ran unsuccessfully as the first black woman to seek uh, a Illinois state senate seat in 1913. She was unsuccessful, but her legacy of black political, women's political participation was a rich one that made it no coincidence that the only black woman U.S. senator and the first African-American president had political roots in Chicago. It is only fitting that President Obama and the First Lady chose, <coughs> among other venues, the 19th Street Baptist Church, home of the founding of the NACW, to worship and pray for change. Wow. Thank you. <laughs> well, I Kelly, have, since I, I I'm the, a million questions from since that, I'm the amateur here, I'm just going to yield to Dr. Giddings. She's told you all of the history, and she is the expert. So I just want well, to say that on behalf of the National Congress of Black Women, the organization that brought truth to the Capitol, I want to thank uh, Becky and Liz and Joan, and then thank all of you for being here. And I'm going to yield back to you, Kelly, so that you can begin the questions. OK. Well, well, thank, I have about a million swirling on my head, as I'm sure all of you do, too, from that, because how could we not? But I, I'd actually like to start with you, Dr. Williams, because okay. This just seems so fitting that this Monday was the birthday of the woman that is called the godfather of, godmother, excuse me, of the <laughs> civil rights, uh, although she was so tough, she really could have been yes. considered the godfather, frankly, thank, thank you very much, but um, of Miss Dorothy Height. Mm -hmm. And it was, I was extremely touched, and I will say pleasantly surprised to see that she landed a Google Doodle. Does everyone know what <laughs> that is? I saw that, yes. I saw that. And that's you know quite an extraordinary accomplishment. I mean, there are plenty of presidents who have never been the subject of a Google Doodle. And for those who don't know, because there are probably a couple people scratching their heads, that's when you go to the home page, the landing page for Google, and you see an image drawn. So for instance, on St. Patrick's Day, you'll see probably a leprechaun or a rainbow or something to that effect. Mm -hmm. And so this is quite um, an extraordinary accomplishment and not one that they extend to everyone. So that's a testament to her incredible legacy. She would have been 102 on Monday. So it got me to thinking, do you have any recollections of, of Miss Height? Oh, I do. Thank you for asking. Uh, you know, there's a Chinese saying that uh, this, the women who hold half the world up, but in the case of the civil rights movement, it was about three-fourths of the women wow. in our community, <laughs> and Dr. Height was one of those people. I met Dr. Height when I was about 17 years old, so naturally, uh, Paula, that means that I'm a Delta, right? <laughs> and I just made Delta Sigma Theta. Yeah. She learned my name that day, and from to the day she passed on, she never forgot my name. She always greeted me by name. She was my neighbor. She was my friend. She was my soror. And whenever, even though we had two different organizations, hers the National Council of Negro Women and ours the National Congress of Black Women, I would go to the Rock, Dr. Height, for advice when I was having some challenges, and she always had great advice, and she would always remind me, as she did other women, you know, that um, we black women don't always do what we want to do, but we sure do what we have to do. And so every day that I, I go to work, I think about that. Maybe this is not something I want to do, but certainly it is something I have to do, and I'm inspired by that every day. Can I, uh, so I'd like to follow up with a question to both of you, which is, um, if you ask the average high school student, most of them know who Rosa Parks is, they know who Harriet Tubman is, and those are both obviously extraordinary women. But I would say that Dr. Height is one of those 
incredibly, immensely influential figures of the civil rights movement that not enough students know enough about or to know her name. And that's one of the reasons I was so um, touched that, that Google paid tribute to her, because I think there are a lot of students who will. Can you talk a little bit about who some of the other women that you both feel are the unsung heroes that we should all know and we should all leave here and go home and Google? Well, I think Dr. Uh, Giddings mentioned a lot of them, but in, in the case of um, the teaching our children about their heroes and sheroes, you can't teach what you don't know. Mm. And I remember when we were attending predominantly black schools, black history was really big in those schools. Uh, so I sometimes go to schools now and I see that people do attempt to, to teach back black history, but I think we lost the opportunity to know so much about our ancestors when we moved from our schools and moved into other schools. And, and I'm not suggesting that was wrong. All I'm saying is we did lose something because we didn't get as much of our history as we normally would have gotten. But there are many women whose names will probably never be known because women were marginalized even in the civil rights uh, movement. We're just beginning to read about some of them. Uh, Dr. Giddings mentioned a lot of them, like uh, Fannie Lou Hamer. I mean, Fannie Lou was a very strong woman, did many things. Uh, there was um, just, ju just you know, you think about Rosa Parks. She named Rosa Parks. But Ella Baker, she's, she's mentioned her. Those are the ones we, we kind of know. But then there are many others who did many things. Diane Nash is probably one of the most unsung sheroes that we have. Uh, this was a young woman, very young. I know the others were young at one time, but Diane was <laughs> just in her early 20s when she was directing the Freedom Rides and when she had to deal with a bus being burned down and finding more people and, and inspiring them to go down south to ride those buses. So I praise uh, Diane Nash all the time. And of course, there were the Lad Ladner sisters, um, whose names we Joyce. don't often yeah. hear. Dory. Yes, um, Dory yes, and Joyce. Dory and, and, and Joyce. Uh, there, there are just so many that it's hard to name all of them. Um, and then we had the pre-civil rights uh, women, and then we got the post-civil rights, but I still think we're in the civil rights period, so I could name some of those too who are doing many things. But I believe we heard many of them, and uh, Dr. Giddings may like to comment further on that. Mm -hmm. One of the things that strikes me about, uh, Dr. Dr. Height was really important. I talked to someone about black women's organizations, and she actually modernized the black women's organization. Talk about she that. Well, she came from, uh, the Y. She rose up in the YWCA, uh, even uh, as a member of the national board. Uh, and she began to understand in the, in the, mid, for, in the mid and late 40s, very important of, of how to structure a black women's organization to be effective. Uh, and she brought that to Delta Sigma Theta and, and later to the National Council of Negro Women mm -hmm. and did uh, many important things, including opening it up to the world. The, the, the Deltas had their first uh, um, uh, international chapter under uh, Dorothy Hyde in Haiti, where aid was given to Haiti and so on. But, and so that kind of um, contribution often doesn't get into the, into the history books. And she was, you know, she was very, you know, she never, she didn't complain very much. I don't, I don't, I don't yeah. didn't know she, as she well. Graciously as she graciously sat on the stage that day. She was, she was very <laughs> yes. gracious, but she talks, only one time I've seen this in a book called Gender Talk, uh, by Beverly Guy Sheftall and Janetta Cole, where she talks for the first time about how uh, the other, m the men in the big six, uh, really shunned her and marginalized her. Mm. Actually pushed and, her out of pictures, I'm told. Pushed her out of pictures. She stood on the end, so she learned to come in the middle so that they couldn't easily crop her out of the pictures. Right. But you know, they do that same thing today. I mean, it's not so different from today. I interviewed uh, Gloria Richardson, who was one of the only women listed on the program at the March on Washington. And I believe she and Merle Evers are the, the two sole surviving women who were, actually had their names listed on the program. Merle could, ended up not she being able to make it that day, right. but her name remained on the program. And Miss Richardson was very emphatic that she faced a lot of um, sexism within the movement. Mm -hmm. And it was interesting to me because I've certainly heard other experts talk about you know stories like that, but it is interesting to me how much it seems like people still don't really want that to be part of the narrative because when the interview ran with Miss Richardson, there was a, a lot of reaction to it, and not all of it positive, where people said, well, I think she was exaggerating or you know, misremembering perhaps being a victim of, of sexism. 
And mm -hmm. so I thought that was really interesting, particularly because you both are speaking so candidly about how that has been an ongoing. Yes, and you know, we, we needn't be ashamed of it because it, it's true in, in, our, in our nation, it's true in the world. I mean, if you think about, say, the Catholic Church, for example, you have nuns who have doctorate degrees, but they can't be cardinals, they can't be bishops, and they certainly can't be popes, you know. So we've got a lot of work to do still. The, the, the civil rights movement, the women's rights movement, they're still not over. We've still got a lot of work to do. One of the most interesting things I read about Dr. Height's contributions is that she helped um, initiate Wednesdays in Mississippi, yes. which I was not familiar with um, until I was reading up on her. And uh, for those who don't know, and please stop and correct me if I'm, if I'm explaining it incorrectly, but where she teamed up with other women uh, from around the country of different races, and they would travel down to Mississippi, and it wasn't just to register voters, it wasn't just to protest, it was literally to reach out to women, the women of Mississippi, and to try to achieve cultural understanding on the issue of civil rights, which fascinates me to no end because I'm a big believer that when it comes to activism, only so much of it is legislation, only so much of it is protest, a lot of it is just living your life. I mean, one of the, the things I've written about is when you look at an issue like same-sex marriage, a lot of the elected officials who have swung on the issue did not swing because they read a book, not because they attended a protest. It's because they'll say, "My neighbor is a gay, is, you know, I have neighbors who are a gay couple. I really like them. They seem friendly, and they're they're raising <laughs> their kids well." So that's one of the reasons I was fascinated that she seemed to recognize this early on. But I couldn't help, of course, thinking about the divide that you mentioned, Dr. Giddings, in terms of within the activist movement and there's sometimes being a divide between white women and black women. Can you talk a, a, a bit about that? I know that's not exactly a small topic, but what are your thoughts on that? <laughs> it's a really well, easy question. <laughs> you know, I, I, I want to come at it from a slightly different perspective because um, I have been thinking about this madly for the last couple of, I mean, certainly that question for a long time. <laughs> But, you know, with this Brothers Keepers initiative mm -hmm. that's just come out, and, uh, and the fact that uh, no funds were relegated for black girls or for black boys, uh, I, start, I, I was trying to figure out why this is allowed to happen in 2014. Uh, and, and, and everybody knows that, you know, it's wonderful to give the resources to, to black youth and black boys in particular. But black girls are in trouble too. So, so what is it that even feminists seem to let, sort of let this go and no one's really talked very much? I mean, a couple of us are, Kimberly Crenshaw, the group of us who have been talking about this. But, but what is going on? And, and you know, I read, it's, this is a little abstract for, uh, I think, this conversation. Mm -hmm. I mean, because of the time. But I read an interesting piece about, it's called Black Male Exceptionalism. And the author, who is a black a law professor, here at Georgetown, a man said, you know, one of the issues is, is that racial justice is seen in the body of a male. Mm. And then I start thinking a little bit more, gender justice is really seen in the body of a white female. Interesting. I mean, even, you know, justice, right? Even the, the icon of justice is a white female. And so, so uh, I, I want us to, you know, I want to start thinking a little bit more deeply than the sort of usual, you know, racism, sexism, because what we're having is um, uh, uh, people who are very liberal, who have great outreach. Susan B. Anthony was one in history who um, uh, personally was fine, but boy, was she was, you know, but the racial question completely myopic mm -hmm. and racist. And men who know better and women who know better. Mm. Uh, this, so there's something else that's going on beyond patriarchy and sexism and racism. That's part of it too, and money and politics, that's part of it too. But there's something very deep in our culture that I think we have to address because if we don't address it, we're never gonna have good coalitions. Uh, and uh, across racial lines and across gender lines, which, which is really necessary uh, to, you know, this, this beast that's coming at us from the right wing, we have to have uh, coalitions. So, so that's, I don't I want to go on, but, well, but that's know, what I've been started thinking you know, about. You know, Dr. Giddings, though, a lot of that is our fault. Uh, black women have done so many things for so long on so little, and we've been super woman, super man, super everything in our families that we have continued to say we are both our brothers and our sister's keeper, and we haven't demanded that same thing from everyone else. I mean, if you look at, um, at uh, mainstream media today, 
when, as you said, you, the, the people, even the black uh, the people on television and so forth, when you think about women, you think white women. When you think about you know blacks, you think of black men. And we don't make enough fuss about that, I don't believe. Uh, some, somehow people in the media like for you to have something controversial to say. And we're just so busy doing what we have to do in our communities to take care of both our brothers and our sisters right. that we often forget about ourselves. Right. But there's so many women who did so many things and who continue to do them right. that we need to begin to bring them forward. Right. Right. You know, maybe I can do it for you and you can do it for another woman, but it has to be done. We have to do the right. protest. Right. That, I agree with you uh, completely. Except also, when we do do it, boy, you can get it. <laughs> I you know. know. I mean, you have to be able to withstand. Um, you can't get. Uh, a, you can't deal with negative, the heat. You got to get out of the kitchen. Of negative <laughs> criticism. So that's one mm. reason why I think people yeah. sort of back up a little bit. But I think you're absolutely right. And that's something that goes across racial lines because I know that there was a project to get more uh, women submitting op-eds because there's a huge disconnect. The, all of the op-ed that are published in major newspapers are disproportionately by men. And part of the, the argument of the newspapers as well, they submit so many more. Um, and this is one of those things that as someone who goes on television a lot, I've, I've heard time and time again from media trainers, which is, you know, oftentimes a booker, will call, or a booker or a producer will call a female expert on a topic and she'll say, you know, I don't know that I'm quite enough of an expert on that. You call a man, he'll say, I've never written anything about it, I've never read anything on it, but what time do I get in the studio? It. I'll Google an article. You know, and that's, that's true. part of the issue. But I couldn't help thinking about this when you were both talking, and I hope I don't cause trouble, but I'm, I, I think it's an important conversation. That's what I do, I cause trouble. Um, is when Gloria Steinem wrote that very provocative op-ed during the 2008 presidential primary titled Women Are Never Front Runners. And it was framed very much as, 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 as arguing that women always have it tougher than men, including um, black men. And it, she mentioned Susan B. Anthony and started with this whole thing. And one of the arguments she made is, you know, even black men got the right to vote before women, but of course we all know that's a, a very simplistic analysis mm -hmm. because there are plenty of black men in Mississippi, Alabama, and elsewhere who were very clearly would say, no, actually I didn't have the right to vote until about the 1960s. Mm -hmm. So that was, there were a lot of problems with the op-ed. That was one of them. But for me, the most obvious problem, and to her credit, Gloria very, I thought she did a great job of saying there was a lot that got cut out from the first draft and what actually got published, and she didn't want it to be this simplistic of a conversation, just like you were saying. It's too big of a conversation to make it a simple op-ed. But for me, what got left out is, yet again, it seemed like black women were invisible because it was sort of, you know, <laughs> black men you have know, it one way. Black, she but, used a black, black woman. Black woman it, it, she, she tried to use, you know, she said, let's say this were a, a woman who had a Kenyan fa father and a white mother, and she had this experience. But it completely missed that there's an entirely different journey. And, and that's what I thought. It, in other words, it reminded me of some of the history that Dr. Giddings talked about. It was almost like she was oh. saying um, a black man didn't have the right to be president before even a white woman was president. And so many black women had supported uh, Hillary right. uh, up to that point. I mean, so many black women were supporting Hillary. Uh, and we supported her to be in the White House as First Lady. And we always give that 90-some percent right. of our vote uh, to candidates like Bill Clinton, who, who was her husband. And it just seems that we were not being appreciated then because we were going back to what had happened it, with, with the other women on temperance or, and, and on you know, women's rights and what have you, where they wanted the white woman to have the vote before the black man. And, and, I, and I say to that, that's, a, that's very selfish, and I think we're seeing a little bit of it today, and we need to stop it because what we do is we diminish our chances for success when we split like that. Uh, black people, when we go to the polls, we almost always know to whom, you know, for whom to vote that's in our best interest. And I'm sometimes puzzled by only 52% or 53% of white women voting for something that's good for them with the rest voting against it. Uh, and, and this usually happens, say, in a governor's race or what have you. And, and I'm just baffled by that because I, I know many of them and I know they know that some of the candidates they are voting for are not in their best interest as a woman just as I know they're not in my best interest as a black woman. So it's a disappointment every time we have an election and white women don't go but so far toward our doing something together that's good for both of us. So I'm hoping that 
if starting in 2014, otherwise we're always all going to be in trouble, that we get closer to more of us voting together, not only for our rights as black people, our rights as women, but um, you know, immigration reform, LGBT rights. I mean, all of those are things that all of us ought to be concerned about. Nothing human should be alien to us. And so I'm, I'm still praying that we're going to move closer mm -hmm. to a bigger vote from our sisters on issues that are important to us. I, I want to open it up to questions <clears throat> in, a, in a minute. So, but, but the last thing I want to ask, and this is something that I think every uh, minority group or gr a group that has been oppressed because technically women are no longer the minority in our country, um, grapples with, which is this. Isn't ideally the, the goal of achieving rights and equality that people can, isn't a hallmark of equality the right to act as an individual? This, this is the debate I constantly run into whenever I write exactly about this issue, whether it's you know, a person of color who says, I don't believe in affirmative action, or it's a, a woman who says, I don't believe that uh, you know, contraception coverage is a legitimate political issue. Um, and the argument I often hear is, well, just like Irish Americans or Italian Americans, came to this country, they were a block, and then they reached a measure of equality, or as some books say, they became white, right? That's the, and then they split their, their voting block because that's what you, that's the whole purpose, is you become a full American when you have the right to say, I'm voting as an individual, not as a block. How do you respond to that? Uh, you may be an individual, but there are collective consequences. Mm. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, and, that's, and, and that's sort of, that's always the issue is, when, when I hear, you know, people, and, and, and certainly you should have your autonomy and independence, but because of the particular history in this country, that there are collective uh, consequences for it, and so I think you have to always think about uh, that. And, and the other thing is that as an individual, you know, and, and going back a little bit to the, to the Steinem uh, uh, question, we forget uh, what, what we now understand, begin to understand, uh, is that we have multiple identities we're African American, we're white, we're, we're women, we have ethnicity, we have a race, we have a gender, we have sexuality, we have class. And we have to learn how to look at them in an intersectional, us in the inter individuals even, in an intersectional way. So the, the flaw in Gloria Steinem's uh, analysis was that she saw Hillary as just a woman. But Hillary has race advantages because she's white. She saw Obama as just a man who has advantages because of his maleness, but he's black, <laughs> so with disadvantages. So when you lose that intersectional, intersectional kind of framework, that's when you make mistakes. Uh, and, uh, and, and of course, it was crazy to, to use a black woman as the example who has race and <laughs> who right. has race mm -hmm. and gender uh, disadvantages, and without so, mentioning the disadvantages in the piece, that, exactly. That's exactly, kind of what got right, left out. Right. So, but that's part of the problem with all is is that we're uh, uh, that that we really think about one, uh, uh, we really think about one aspect of our identities when we're all have, we have multiple identities. And, and, and I don't want to go back as way. far as uh, Gloria, whom, whom I love very much, uh, but she, you know she made a big yeah. mistake. Yeah. Uh, there was also Hillary more recently when speaking uh, said something to the effect of, um, of uh, the great issue of, of equality, the great issue of the century was women's equality. And I'm going, I mean, yes, that is one great issue, <laughs> right. but couldn't you've just added race, you know, culture, couldn't you've just added some of these other things uh, to it and it would have made me more comfortable because I always have to think about how much the civil rights movement did for all women. You see, the civil rights movement didn't have black people written on it. It, it helped all people. Uh, it's still helping all people to achieve rights. And we just like to be acknowledged sometimes for doing that. Uh, it, it, the civil rights movement is not over. So we still have a chance for women to remember that. Keep in mind that you're talking about my ancestors or you're leaving my ancestors out when you just say, women's equality is the great issue of the century. I agree it is great, but there's something else that's there for me, and it has to be, as Dr. Giddings has just said, my blackness also is very important. If we could put the two of those together, we could overcome some of those crazy things we're hearing. And isn't it, isn't it interesting that years ago, 
in history, it was the Republicans who were perhaps supporting us and supporting women's rights more. And you look at what's going on today, uh, and, and it is totally switched because initially it was the Democrats who were not supporting for equal rights, uh, supporting equal rights for women. It was the Southern Democrats who didn't care about me. But it has totally turned around now. And we have to continue to support those who are supporting us and to recognize that whatever it was that the R people used to do for us, to understand they're not doing it anymore. So we really need to vote in 2014 and understand who it is that has more of our rights, you know, at heart than um, than, than than they had years ago. It's it's totally changed, and we have to be cognizant of those changes. We have to watch what's going on. Um, so whoever has any questions, please go ahead to the microphone, and uh, we'll get ready to start taking some questions from the audience. And I'm I'm going to ask one final question to both of you. Um, multiracial people, mixed race families, are the fastest growing demographic in the country, and. My question is, how do you think that is going to shape or possibly redefine uh, civil rights as we think of them and discuss them here in this country? Or will it? Well, I, I would say, like Dick Gregory always says, I just wake up every morning and listen to the news, and I just wish white people would start you know, beating up on their side of the presidency and the race questions and leave <laughs> the black side alone. Um, you know. <laughs> Many of us are, are children of multiracial. Uh, our, our parents. My, my mom is not black. Uh, the, ma many of us, you know, we. I mean, you can look at us and see somebody was there. Something happened. Somebody deserted <laughs> yeah, their. Happened. Somebody deserted their children <laughs> right. too, because we always yeah. blame black men for that right. desertion. But all of us didn't have black fathers or black right. mothers, so. Or as President Harding said, someone jumped a fence somewhere. Yes. Yes. Of course. So. Who um, was I'm, allegedly part black? That's. For those who don't know, President <laughs> so, um, Harding is white. I'm not sure black. what question it raises because even when we're multiracial, uh, we know we're black, and that's the way most of us have to operate as though we are black. Well, the, well, the reason I, I let me rephrase it. The reason I'm asking is because that's changing generationally. The the, the self identification mm -hmm. is shifting. Mm -hmm. The younger you go, and that's what I'm really curious about is because what you just said. I mean, that's very much what I heard in my family. But mm -hmm. what you're starting to see now with younger people. They don't necessarily identify that way. That doesn't mean mm -hmm. they don't consider themselves minorities. Yes, it just means that there is more complexity to it. And so it I'm is the big issue for them. I mean, because well, we have people of all kinds of cultures in our families, and I know most people do. So we are learning to get along. When when we used to just say, "Oh, those white people," you know, "Oh, right. that," you know, that those are our relatives now, the Latinos. Right. Those are our in-laws now, or what have you. So um, I always say that we can't hate people. Uh, just because of the, the color of their skin, we have to understand that there is another relationship there, and now it's called family. family. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, uh, we, we have to start rethinking what we mean by black community. Mm. It's changed, and uh, and uh, uh, I, I, um, I, I can't think of his last name, uh, Washington Post reporter who wrote Eugene book Robinson? Called, Eugene Robinson wrote Disintegration. I knew which book you were talking right, about. Right, exactly. <laughs> uh, in which he talks about uh, that the black community is now several communities. Mm -hmm. it's, the, it's the biracial community, it's the uh, uh, Caribbean American community, it's uh, the all kinds of immigrant, immigrant African communities, and also economic stratification. There's the real, the real elites, there's sort of the almost elites. Or as a friend of mine used to say, those who are who are doing well and those who are doing good, or something like that, <laughs> and, uh, uh, and 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 of course the you know the the, the impoverished community. So you can't say, uh, uh, and he and he says so. Any, anybody who talks about the black community, I was talking about really symbolically, <laughs> because it's not. So we really have to start thinking about that, and and particularly, I think these biracial communities. Someone said that only four out of ten, you know, African Americans now. Four out of every ten African Americans have the experience of slavery, the South, the Great Migration to the North. Right. Well, look at President Obama's one. There's a different uh, black uh, black experience, uh, uh, and so and lots of others have that have a different experience. So we do have to rethink those categories. So I'm going to turn it over to questions now. But one of the reasons I asked the question, and one of the reasons I knew exactly which book you were talking about, is because I've, I've written. I, I also write for the Root. And one, two of the articles I've written in the last year deal with this issue in terms of how it's going to affect policy on the long term. And the first issue is in terms of the census. Mm 
-hmm. They have no idea. I mean, they're pretending that they know what they're going to do, but they really are not prepared <laughs> for what they're really going to do <laughs> with a country in which you have an entire generation of people where now mm -hmm. it's not just I'm half black, half white. My mother was half Brazilian and half Chinese. Right. My father is half Haitian and half um, Filipino. You know, it is. It is, this is changing the face of our, our country, but in terms of policy and what that means in terms of how we talk about race, I think that's what, that's why I asked in terms of the civil rights movement. I don't think people really know how it's gonna affect civil rights issues. And, and on that note, the other article I wrote that has to do with this issue is, I wrote about um, affirmative action um, when the latest case came before the Supreme Court. And the reason, and, and surprisingly, the angle that ended up, t the piece ended up taking when I interviewed experts was, most of the experts I interviewed support affirmative action, and almost all of them said it's not working for the people it's supposed to be working for. And one of the reasons they all held that position is because the overwhelming uh, beneficiaries at elite colleges have been shown to be either uh, children who are the children of immigrants, or their parents do not live in America, so they did not endure slavery, they did not endure segregation, or children who are mixed race. Um, and from well-to-do backgrounds. So there is something very complicated to this issue of how we define the black community and civil rights issues that matter to quote the black community when there are right. many right. different definitions. And there are people who, some of the people I interviewed who feel very strongly mm -hmm. that affirmative action programs, when you look at what President Johnson said about why we needed them at the time, it was not to benefit someone like President Obama. Yes. That's what some people very firmly believe. Exactly. Yet on the other hand, does anyone really think that it was a bad thing that he became the first black editor of Harvard Law Review? Right. I mean, right. so right. it's, it's so, so Kelly, you asked us the question you already knew the answer to. <laughs> well, <laughs> the, the answer, you're the expert. My, my official answer on this is I don't know the answer. Yeah, no, I don't know what it's no, gonna look like. Either. I have no idea, yeah. but I, I was curious. <laughs> if anyone else has thoughts, okay. Yeah. Please say your name, your affiliation, and what your question is. Uh, and my, name, my name is Nancy Tate. I'm with the League of Women Voters. And I wanted to pick up on some of the previous comments because we agree the civil rights era is not over. We're very focused around the country in fighting a lot of the voter suppression laws that we feel are hitting all the mm -hmm. underrepresented communities. And within that, many of the specific laws are hitting women in particular, even though women's voting turnout in general is higher than men's. So I was sort of surprised you didn't all touch on that too much. It's sort of the most contemporary issue that we see, and I just wondered if you wanted to elaborate on it or how to, we can better work together to help fight the laws, but then because a lot of these laws have actually passed, how to get the communities who are affected to understand what the new realities are so they can get around them, so that they can get the identification, so that they cannot be, um, disenfranchised, which is clearly the intent of some of those laws. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that's kind of what I was talking about when I talked about the very low level, just quite, just barely above 50, when we vote on some mm -hmm. of the issues that we know we have in common, uh, we need to get, even though there are more white women who vote, but a larger percentage of black women vote for the things that benefit us most. So we need to move, um, I I'm still looking for the 3% of the black women who don't vote with us, but um, I think uh, we, we need to work on more white women understanding that they should be able to vote in their best interest, not just because their spouses or someone told them to vote a certain way. We have too much of that. We have too much. We're losing right now. We're losing ground. So we really do need to come together and have a discussion on what you, the question you just asked. A follow-up, though, to her. I, I don't think I asked both of you this, and it, it's certainly worth asking this evening. What would you say are the, the most important civil rights issues of the moment? Uh, single uh, black women have uh, accumulated wealth of $5 is the average. $5. Uh, it is uh, the subprime, I mean, there are many things, but, but, but the subprime mortgage crisis particularly uh, was the uh, largest transfer of wealth from the black community to the white community that we've ever had in our history. Um, uh, uh, and uh, uh, and uh, as long as we, uh, it's that, and, that, and that's what gets me so crazy also about Brothers Keepers and, these, and the policies that ignore 
um, African American women. But that is a very, I think that's a very crucial, there are, there are lots of, there are other issues too, but that's a really crucial issue. Dr. Williams? Well, I, I agree, it's, it's the economy. Uh, until we get that right, uh, some of the other rights to have don't matter a whole lot. Uh, we, we need to really work on that and, um, you know, until we get it right, it's, it's just a problem, a big problem. And that's one of the rights, uh, one of the things that we could work together on um, with all women, all kinds of women. Um, it wouldn't be just about race. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. There are many single mothers in other communities who need this help. So I, I think women need to have uh, um, another conference. We, you know, mm -hmm. we haven't had right. a real conference of all of us. I go to many conferences. There may be three or four black women there. There may be no Asian <coughs> women there. There may be one Latino one woman there. We really need to kind of even up those groups, you know, and, 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 and talk about what it is that mm -hmm. we can do together uh, rather than so much of what's wrong with what we do, but just mm -hmm. what can we do together. You know what your comments make me think about, uh, Dr. Williams? Is I make you think, oh my <laughs> God, oh, I mean, oh, very, no. very, very much. Uh, 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 we're always, our metric is always compared to men. Suppose we had a, a sense of, try to, of equity where we want women to be equal to one another. Suppose mm -hmm. we want to start, suddenly start thinking about, thinking about those terms. Uh, it could be very interesting. And then the intersection is right there. Yeah, I've always you know? said I don't want equal pay with men. I want more pay because we do more work than men do. <laughs> exactly, exactly, exactly. Your name and your affiliation and your question, please. Uh, hi, my name is Haley. I'm a student at the University of Maryland. Um, my question is actually about uh, Sandberg's recent lean-in hit philosophy and sort of the trickle-down theory of gender equality it espouses. Um, to what extent do you think that may be doing a disservice to women all across the racial and economic spectrum? And if you think it's doing a disservice, what alternatives would you propose? I'm not familiar with it. I haven't read her book, but I, I know I don't mind being called bossy because I am, mm -hmm. and I'm proud mm -hmm. of it. So mm -hmm. and I've, I've put that oh, on the record. <laughs> but is there, is there a specific, could, could, you, could you elaborate on specifically which philosophy you're talking about? You're not talking about um, the Ban Bossy campaign, right? No, no, yeah. more specifically the idea that women who are CEOs or who are otherwise in position of power need, if, if they sort of step it up and provide examples that whatever they gain will trickle down to women all across the economy. And that that's, then, and that rather than like lobbying for structural reforms overall, that we just need to see these examples in power and that that will sort of in, encourage it. women everywhere to feel like they can be bossy and that that's what it'll take. They can do what? They can do at, at the, at the risk of, of butchering it in a somewhat oversimplified right, right, way. No, right, totally right, got right, it. Right, right. I haven't read the book. I just ordered the book, in fact. It'll be waiting for me when I, when I uh, get back uh, to uh, Massachusetts, but I haven't read it. Uh, the complaints I've heard about it, so this is secondhand, uh, are, and what's op what, what people have been optimistic about is that at least Sandberg gives sort of a road map of you know, sort of an optimistic way women can achieve in some, some way instead of just complaining. That's what I've heard, the positive aspect of it. And I, Katha Pollock talked about that at The Nation, and I sort of trust Katha's uh, feminist instincts. Um, the complaints are, uh, a number of bell hooks and others have talked about that, again, the woman idea is just like a universalist idea without taking into consideration uh, and certainly, well, we know that trickle down. I'm not even, deal trickle down is just, you know, it hasn't worked for anything. So it's not, certainly not going to work for that. Uh, uh, but that it's, but it's kind of this universalist concept of woman that's not taken into consideration. Again, the intersection of, of race and, and class. And, uh, uh, and, and, but, and, and that's what I've heard. But, that's, uh, but I, haven't, um, I haven't read the book myself yet. I, you know, I will say this. I, I've written a, a couple pieces on uh, Cheryl and Moore, and since I, not any book reports, because as I said, I had uh, read the book, but in terms of kind of her impact on the conversation, specifically about the balance issue, uh, the family, life, work balance, and the, the having it all debate, even though I kind of hate that term because mm -hmm. men don't get to have it all either. I mean, you know, you show me, I mean, President Obama made it to the White House and he admitted he barely saw his children for the two years leading up to, the, to getting there. I mean, that's the trade-off. So, the, so my only 
criticism, I would say, if you could even call it that, is I would say that Cheryl and Marissa, um, the president of Yahoo, people who get there, I just wish I'd like, I, I'd like to see a lot more honesty from all people who make it to those positions uh, about the sacrifices required to get there. Because we know that they can get there. I, I have, you know, I know personally many powerful women, but they all made sacrifices to do it. And so the only thing that, that when I hear about the trickle down that it's inspiring, it is inspiring to other women, but I think we have to be honest about the trade-offs involved. That's, that's really my only, my only critique, is that it, it wasn't easy for her to do it. She has nannies who help her do it. There are women who can't afford nannies to help them do it. And that needs to just be, that's not a bad thing, that's not a criticism of her, but that truth needs to be out there. And I don't think that's specific to women. I, like I said, you show me a male who's running a Fortune 500 company, I'll show you someone who's missed a soccer game, a ballet recital, you know, an anniversary, um, and that needs to, I think, be part of the conversation. And I, I think that that's probably, I've sent some of the sort of pushback to, you know, it all looks like sunshine. She makes it sound like sunshine and rainbows, and, you know, mm -hmm. we, we can all skip to the corner office together. Um, and the but only, God bless her for getting there. The only thing I would add is that, and then some of those women had to forego some of the things they might have wanted to do in order to be where right. they are. And, uh, you know, then they many times give the lecture to the, young woman, you know, hey, look, I did it, and you know, you can do it, but everybody can't do it without the help, you know, as some of the things that you were mentioning. Yeah. And I also think, and I'm gonna add this to the, to the whole honesty debate, I think that, I think I actually wrote this in the piece I did on Cheryl and Marissa, that, you know, there are certain jobs that are not compatible with having a really healthy personal life. That's just a fact, and, and that doesn't even just mean being a parent. If you are, you know, if anyone watches the show Homeland, if you're a CIA operative, you're probably not going on date night. Mm -hmm. That's probably not a part of your life for a certain amount of time. And that doesn't, that's not a bad thing. Someone has to do it. Someone has to be in the CIA. <laughs> Someone has to be a surgeon who's on call. There are certain sacrifices. I just think we as a society, particularly when it comes to women and the pressure we put on women, we're not honest about sometimes what it takes. And I actually think that would be better. If someone said from the outset, you can get there. This is what it's going to cost you, and I'm being honest about mm -hmm. it. Instead of just mm -hmm. saying, I got here, it's really fabulous, it was really easy, and you could do it too. You know, let's mm -hmm. kind of talk about some of the little challenges. Just quickly, I ordered the book because I read about the proliferation of lean in chapters all over college campuses. And Sandberg opened the first chapters at Howard University. Oh, that's right. You know, I think also to deflect some of the criticism. Uh, it was a very smart political move. But this is going to be, it's an important question that you raise because this is going to, we're, we're in the midst of a, is a, of a but, well, something I'm, I'm, really going I'm on. I'm reading, uh, not, not from the woman's side, I'm reading the other book, The Angry White Men, because I'm trying to figure out how they got that way and how I can help them you know, to get unangry <laughs> yeah. for those who are. You know, I, I think we need to know both sides yeah, yeah. of it. We need, we need a book club to follow yeah. this. Yes, we'll have a book club we're gonna get started. Thank you for your question. And, you. and that wasn't meant for anybody in this audience. You're all nice guys who are here, I'm yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> we'll soon find out. Hi. <laughs> Hi there, your name, your affiliation, Hi. your question. Yes, my name's Melissa Joukowsky and I'm actually with the American Association of University Women. And um, I have to completely agree with your statement that our fight is not over. Um, but I was hoping you could please speak to the point about um, the lasting uh, legacy, really, for women that did evolve out of the Civil Rights Act across the um, across the racial spectrum. I'm sorry, I didn't, he I didn't hear the latter part of the question. Oh, sure. The, um, if you could speak to like the legacy and the lasting impact of the Civil Rights Act on women uh, across the whole racial spectrum. You must have some ideas about that to ask the question. <laughs> yes. Actually, yeah, that's why I'm here, because I yeah, do yeah. want to learn about it. Uh, um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just generally curious. I mean, I know women obviously gained a lot out of the whole movement, but um, you know, I'm like, how, what, what, besides like everyone I know to thank for the role that they played in that, like, how specifically, like, what, what can I thank specifically for, you know, being where I am today and having the opportunities I have today as a woman, thanks to the Civil Rights Act? Well, one thing I, th I think you can do is take from it that women have always had to struggle, and we may always have to, but one of the things is that Fortunately, it isn't too, too difficult. As Dr. Hyde said, we don't always do what we want to do, but we always do what we have to do. And if we'll keep that in mind, 
that we can do this together and lighten the load on each other, then I think uh, we'll be better off. We have time for one last question. Thank you. Um, I'm Rawa um, with uh, uh, George Mason University. Thank you so much for being here. We, I learned a lot at least. Um, my question is okay. about um, how do I deal with, in my personal life, maybe some young black women and their resistance to womanism or feminism. Mm -hmm. um, whenever I uh, go to these conferences, I'm also you know, kind of appalled that I'm the only one there when I think some of these issues are things that we face um, every day. On the one hand, I hear um, older black women saying, mm -hmm. well, we're black women, we're strong, um, so we don't need these initiatives. And then on the other hand, I hear uh, younger black women saying, well, I need to navigate the workspace. I need to navigate um, the white space. Um, and I'm not worried about this feminism. So can you maybe speak to that? We're going out with a bang. <laughs> <laughs> Last question. Well, I think one of the things we have to do is understand that feminism means something different to many women. Mm -hmm. And don't expect that everyone is going to agree with our definition of feminism. Uh, I, I know that that's been a conversation recently about uh, the, 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 the woman in the White House, in the big house as we call it. Um, we, you've written on that, Kelly, so you should no be the comment. one speaking to this. <laughs> Got oh, you no, no comment, no. But, but I think we, the, have, we, we, we have to learn to accept each person's definition of, of her feminism. And also on certain days, maybe my feminism is not what's important to me as my being a, being black, uh, so we have a lot of different things going on different days. So we just have to look at what it is I'm dealing with that day. Uh, I'd like to go to every conference. I'd like to be involved in everything that has something to do with choice. I would like to have been on the hill for ERA the other day, but I you know I'm one person at a certain point. I th I can't make all of them. Now don't tell me I'm not a feminist. You know I care about what's going on. I just sometimes have to give my attention to something other than that side of me. I, I think there's uh, also um, people are upset with the word more than with yeah. what it means. Mm -hmm. you know. I, I remember in the, in the late 60s, you know, you used to have these, you know, those consciousness raising sessions. It was interracial women. And the white women say, well, I came to feminism when da 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 And they, you know, when you go, I mean, real stories, I'm not I'm making fun of them, but really important stuff. Uh, and then the black woman would be next and she'd say, well, I'm not a feminist. I believe in the family. Right? And then she would talk about the most feminist life. Right? So some of it is, some of it is, is, is definitions, but I applaud you for working with people because it's, it's, it can be very hard. I understand the frustration of it uh, and uh, the, 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 the difficulty, but you do have to be patient and you do have to f really figure out what people really mean when they, when they say these things and, what is the, and why are they saying it? I'm into my now w the why of everything. <laughs> of what's going on because, uh, because, of, because it's against logic not to be feeling, have a sense of, of a, a liberatory feeling about yourself. It's against logic, you know. And so when, once it's against logic, then you have to figure out what is, you have to unpack it. What is, what is really going on? What are people frightened of? Uh, what are people associating it with? What is the linguistic difficulties with it? Uh, but that takes a lot of patience, and I, I applaud you. Uh, for um, for having that patience and working with your friends, I, I, I forgot to ask: Was she black? I, I can't see that well mm -hmm, up there. She was. Oh, yeah. okay. Mm -hmm. I, I she, said, she said, "Oh yes." She, she said, "Oh yes." Okay. Um, I, I will I will comment briefly to say that you know I I, I think Dr. Giddings was right on the money that. Um, you know, that F word has become about as uh, toxic <laughs> as the other one, yeah. you know, and, and as inflammatory in some circles, because study after study shows that you ask, particularly among young women, are you a feminist? And I think the majority at the moment, according to the last poll, because it goes back and forth, but the last poll was that the majority said, no, I'm not a feminist. And then you go through the list of things of what they support, mm -hmm. and it fits with what most people consider being a feminist. 
So there is sort of, I hate to say this because it makes it sound so superficial, there's a bit of a branding issue. You know, that's what they would say in corporate America, feminism were a brand. It's got a branding issue. And part of that I would say has to, you know, some of that responsibility does lie with those who have dubbed themselves, you know, feminist leaders. Because one of the things that you often see happen, I've, I've had this happen to me, other people I know of have had this happen, is you say something that one prominent feminist disagrees with and they decide that you're out of the club. Right, and so then it's like, yeah. well, you're not a feminist, and then it well, makes people say, well, I don't want. Well, then if I can't, you know, if you're not allowed to be a feminist, if you say one thing and have an express an opinion, and that creates problems, you know, I got in a lot of trouble, and I, and this is, you know, talk about ending with a bang, you know, because I said, I can't make the choice of whether or not a woman who works as an exotic dancer is not a, not a feminist. I don't have a right to determine that for her. I don't know her policy positions. And there are people. I said the same thing about you know a model who poses in the Sports Illustrated swimming. There were feminists who said. I have a right to say that, and she's not one, you know? And that kind of dialogue, it's, you know, I'd rather focus on the issues and not on those types of more superficial, and I think that has kind of made and, it and we go through the same thing in the black community about who's blacker than whom, right. you know? And, <laughs> right, uh, that's true, the test. Yeah, it's, right, it's like so a test. It, it's a comparison. Who belongs and who doesn't? Uh, there, there are those who say President Obama is not black enough, right. and yet you have the Limbaugh's and others who say he's, he's too, too black. black. So, he's way too know, black. It's, it's very confusing. <laughs> so. As, I guess it, it's, it's what I'm feeling, what I know I am, and I act out what I believe a black person would do or what a feminist would do, and I, I just can't give a whole lot of credence to what everybody else thinks because I really don't need to be validated as a right. black person or as a feminist. And if I know that, then I'm comfortable doing what I'm doing. I say the bigger the tent, the better. Yes. So <laughs> um, let's have a big round of applause for our wonderful panelists tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks again to the National Women's History Museum for, for hosting us this evening. I'm going to turn it back over to Professor Chapman. Hi, thanks very much. Um, what a wonderful conversation. So I am tasked with uh, some wrap-up comments, and so I was taking notes in the back of my book here because <laughs> I didn't bring a notebook. Um, and I just want to say a few things um, that occurred to me while we were having our discussion. Um, and the phrase uh, that came out of the 1970s black feminist movement, um, all the women are white and all the blacks are men, right, resonates through this conversation. Um, and I think that's one of the things that causes that resistance that the um, uh, student asked about in terms of her question about black women's reactions to feminism. Um, I have experienced the same thing among family members and friends, um, as well as students um, younger, younger than me, right? This idea of like, well, I'm not a feminist, or why would I be a feminist? You know, I think part of that, in addition to the answers that uh, the panelists gave, well, is the idea of associating um, feminism with white women, right? And that women's issues are white women's issues, right? Um, and I've talked about this in another venue, and I think that one of the things that feminists need to do um, as we engage also the issues of solidarity that we've talked about in this conversation um, is to think about uh, our standard of freedom, if we base our standard of freedom or what we would call freedom or what we would call equality or what we would call progress, if we base it on what's good for impoverished women of color, right, um, um, uplifting impoverished women of color or fighting for their equality or fighting for their freedom, however, however they might define that, will also free those of the rest of us who are more privileged in other ways, who are not impoverished, right, or who are women but not women of color, or who are men of color, et cetera, right? Um, eliminating those intersecting oppressions. Right? Um, and another thought, we were talking about biracialism or multiracialism, and it, it, uh, I observe that even as we more and more discuss biracialism and multiracialism as, as issues um, and as identity points in our current society and the society of the future US, um, white supremacist policies and white privilege persist right, and grow and are actively being cultivated by right, things like the decimation of the Voting Rights Act and those kinds of issues. Right? Um, and so I think that we still need to find some version of solidarity. Um, and it's, you know, authentic blackness, you know, I'm blacker than you, whatever, of course, can't be the thing, right? <laughs> that is not uh, solidarity that works, and it never was, really. Um, but, you know, some version of solidarity that unites um, oppressed peoples, right, um, 
who are oppressed by patriarchy and oppressed by uh, racism or white supremacy. And those intersect and work together and always have. Right? Um, and it's the economy, stupid, right? Money, <laughs> capitalism, um, eliminating poverty, renewing the fight against uh, the oppressive excesses of capitalism, I think, needs to be a plank in all of this, too, as we continue to think about civil rights and women and women's relationship to civil rights. So my wrap-up comments. Um, and thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much for coming and joining with us. Um, so I want to uh, thank especially those um, uh, entities on the George Washington University campus who helped to organize and have uh, supported this. Um, we mentioned uh, Jennifer James and the Africana Studies Program. Um, and Jennifer is still here over here in the corner. Raise your hand. Um, uh, who helped sponsor this uh, program. Also, the History Department, the Women's Studies Department, um, and the uh, Global Women's Institute here on the GWU campus um, are supportive of this initiative. So, we have. Um, hors d'oeuvres, uh, drinks, snacks, et cetera, up the stairs, um, go up the stairs in the lobby up to the arts uh, gallery upstairs. And so we'll hopefully get a chance to mix and mingle and continue to have this conversation. So thanks very much.